Hey everyone, this is Rika Riley, and on behalf of Rivers Chicago, we would like to thank each and every one of you who has joined in with us in our phase two of our We Build campaign. We have been gaining momentum within the last month and a half, but we are still in need of partners, and your support can help make all the difference in this endeavor. So join us during the month of November. Our targeted partnership goal is 2,500 partners who will sow a one-time seed of $100, and we still have a ways to go. So pray for us and sow into this today. We believe River Chicago is a great place to invest. Immediately following my voice, you will find four different ways you can sow into this endeavor. May God bless you and more grace. Hey everybody, thank you for joining the River Chicago Worship Online Experience. I'm Pastor Robert Anderson, the Executive Pastor here, and I want to thank all of our first-time visitors, our family and friends for tuning in today. I want you to know that you can find us on all the social media outlets. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and also YouTube. We want to thank you for tuning in today. You know, the Bible says in Psalms 91, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And that's just where we want you today, under the protection and the provision of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we get ready to go into the broadcast, I'm asking you right now, start your watch parties, share, 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 and engage. We'd like to see your hearts and your thumbs up. We really appreciate that. At the conclusion of the broadcast, I'll be back and we're going to have a time of giving and sowing and you'll have an opportunity to further this gospel through the ministry here at River Chicago. Now get ready. We're about to have a great worship experience with our next speaker. God bless you and you all have a phenomenal day.
and um, this month is progressing and we're looking forward to all that God will share as we've launched a new and exciting series um, on the subject of Christ the Apostle. Uh, so uh, this afternoon I want to deal with um, just a couple of aspects of his apostolic ministry, um, dealing with him as a messenger of the kingdom, if you're taking notes, as a sender, and perhaps we will get into the interceding dimension of his ministry. So let's go to the word here very quickly, and thanks once again for tuning in. Do me a favor, go ahead and share this broadcast, make sure you like it, and then share it and encourage and invite your friends and followers to be a part of what's happening here uh, in Rivers, Chicago. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, uh, verse number 17 through 20. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus was, t was walking by the Sea of Galilee, uh, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. So, Father, breathe upon this word and give us a level of focus and engagement concerning Christ and his apostolic ministry as we've been building on the fact that he is the apostle and high priest of our profession and we are to be drawn to him and to see him in light of being one who is sent by you. Let him also be personified as one sent uh, as a messenger of the kingdom and give us uh, the wherewithal to align our lives and to, de to develop a focus uh, that is centralized around the kingdom of God. I speak that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the kingdom of God uh, is a message uh, that's also central to Christ's apostolic ministry, like healing was a central theme, deliverance uh, was a central theme, the developing and building of people was a central theme. So there are a lot of various central themes consistent with Christ's ministry, but I believe that all of them from an apostolic paradigm tie into the kingdom of the Most High God because the kingdom is what was promised all throughout the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, there's a powerful passage in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, where it says, The God of heaven shall set up another kingdom. It shall not be left to another people, but his kingdom shall consume, break in pieces, and destroy all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. There's a verse in Psalm 102 or 103, I believe, that says, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. And interestingly, the concept of the kingdom is interwoven in the actual uh, book of creation going back to the book of Genesis. And so when Jesus preached the kingdom, everywhere he went, he preached the kingdom, he demonstrated the kingdom. There, there's a, a, a myriad of verses in the gospels that emphasize Jesus preaching the kingdom, Jesus declaring that if his kingdom was of this world, then his servants would fight for him. That's in John chapter 18. So a lot of powerful uh, revelations and principles concerning the kingdom of God are connected to Jesus' ministry as one sent by God. So let me say it this way. Jesus, uh, as a representative of God the Father, was sent by him to inaugurate the kingdom, to establish the throne of the king, uh, to establish the policies and procedures of the kingdom of God in the earth realm, and he did it through preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And so those who are sent by Jesus have a responsibility to proclaim the same message. That means that legitimate apostolic gifts who have a seal in them, a means of, uh, to, to, to approve, a, a means of proving and validating their ministries, you'll find them teaching and preaching on the kingdom of God in the context of advancing the purposes of God. And so Jesus, when he was recruiting his team, he hits these, he bumps into these two guys and tells them, repent. He's preaching, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then Jesus begins to walk by the Sea of Galilee. Of course, he gets Simon and Andrew. My, my point is, is that everywhere Jesus went, Matthew chapter 9, Jesus was preaching uh, in their cities and in villages and teaching the gospel of the kingdom. And he sees the multitudes and fainting and as sheep and having no shepherd. Uh, so he's preaching the kingdom. I mean, Luke chapter 4, Jesus is preaching the kingdom as well. And powerful things are being transacted. So a critical core 
door to legitimize apostolic ministry will be predicated upon uh, the apostle or that apostolic church being able to articulate the kingdom of God where uh, you, 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 you preach in, in, in light of what it means to be born again so people can access the kingdom. You preach in light of what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom. You preach in light of who is the king of the kingdom and his rule and his sovereignty. Uh, you preach in the context of all in the kingdom realm are subject to the king. Uh, in other words, uh, in, in in a natural in a kingdom the king owns everything the land and the people and somehow when we relegate ministry to just church alone and not kingdom people have the uh, the flawed concept that they are actually in charge that's why Jesus as a representative of God said listen I ain't come to speak what I want to speak the words I speak are the words of the one that sent me and so if that's a very powerful manifestation and we have a lot of teaching that we've done in a separate series uh, and even books on the subject of the kingdom of God but to legitimize one who is sent by God you will find a central theme of their ministry being predicated upon them teaching and preaching on the kingdom apostles today must have a working knowledge of the kingdom of God you, you you can't see the kingdom except you're born again you can't access the kingdom except you're born again uh, and, and, and God's kingdom is above every other kingdom we've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and so we've got to understand the concept of the kingdom we've got to understand the power of what it means to be a part uh, 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 of the kingdom of God in the context of our citizenship so there are rights that we know that are available to us and when apostles teach that, when apostles preach that, when apostolic churches develop that as a core curriculum in their local assembly, it empowers believers uh, to live an impactful life in the realm of time as a citizen of the kingdom, as a citizen of their natural nation as well or whatever nation they live inside of and to rise above the dictates of darkness within that kingdom or within that specific nation or territorial grid. Let me say it this way. It's almost like a person who is an ambassador. They're sent from one nation to another nation and they're sent uh, with the vested interest and authority of their nation, they live inside of a foreign nation in an embassy. They have what is known as diplomatic immunity. And in the nation they're sent by their nation to, uh, uh, they are not subject to the laws of that land because they are called to live by the law of the land from which they come. Uh, and they're immune to the laws of the land in which they're in. I'm giving you this in a very generic perspective. So think about Jesus sent by God as a representative of God to advance the kingdom of God. He's an apostle, and when he hits this realm, uh, he lives by the principles, policies, procedures, and protocols of the kingdom. He wasn't subject to sickness. He wasn't subject to demons. He wasn't subject to lack. He wasn't subject to fear. Anything that was active in the earth where he was sent to colonize that territory uh, and advance the kingdom, he overcame everything germane to it. Uh, and that is what God wants for you and I. Not that you don't feel things connected, consistent with your humanity, uh, but you don't live there either because there's capacity in you to rise above it because the kingdom that you're a part of consumes and breaks in pieces every other kingdom. The capacity of an apostle and apostolic people to articulate and demonstrate the kingdom is imperative to forming a proper type of mindset of what it means to have dominion in the earth realm among those that they are sent by God to lead and to develop in all things kingdom. Here's another dimension of Christ's apostolic ministry. Remember uh, our foundational verse, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1, uh, we're called to partake of a heavenly calling. We're holy people. We've got to consider, be drawn towards Jesus and see him in light as an apostle and the high priest of our profession. Christ is a sender. John chapter 20, verse 21 and 22. Then said Jesus to them, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me. The, 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 the word sent uh, correlates with two specific Greek words in the New Testament. Once again, the Greek word apostolos found in the Greek key 652, where we get the word apostle from. And then the word apostolic found in the Greek key 652. 49, which is the word apostello, which is where we get the word apostolic from. They both have their origin in the word sent. And so Jesus, as, 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 a, as, as one sent by God to represent him, is also sending people to represent he himself 
Christ. And so now he, he says this powerful verse. He said, the, Jesus, Jesus says, peace as the Father sent me, I'm going to send you. Look at verse 22. And when he has said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Now this is interesting because Jesus is still in the earth realm, but he's sending individuals. Now, a part of our apostolic how can I say this, development uh, from a cultural perspective as citizens of God's kingdom, there are people that are joined the local assemblies. They may be impactful in the political arena. Hear me clearly. But when you join an apostolic ministry and the kingdom mindset is developed, and people get a revelation, my life is not my own, but I'm hidden in Christ, you can now begin to develop the proper template that when you go into government, when you go into politics, when you go into banking, you're not just going your own intellectual prowess and strength, your own ability, but you're going as one who is sent by God as a citizen of the kingdom, and you operate as an ambassador from the realm of God, and now you go, and your job is to advance the vested interest of the one who sends you. You're not going preaching and, and, and teaching and coughing in Hebrew, and sneezing in Greek. No, you live a lifestyle that is exemplary. Uh, you, your orientation is different. Uh, there's a glory that's on your life. There's a presence on you. Uh, you've been praying for co-workers. Uh, you've been praying in that particular grid and because you've been sent by God, uh, you have authority to manifest the nature of the king uh, in that realm uh, and all of a sudden God will begin to use you to be a legitimate representative of his uh, and there's an arming of your faith. Uh, there's a weaponizing of your faith to do things you wouldn't do uh, if you were just going as a mere believer and not understanding that I'm a believer who is sent by God because uh, I'm an heir of God and I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And so Jesus said, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. He breathed on his disciples. Uh, they received the Holy Ghost. Uh, you got power to get sin forgiven. Uh, you got power uh, to, to, to bring condemnation when folk won't come out of agreement with certain things. Uh, and so a part of you and I being sent We've got to understand that we are sent to represent him. And in the Bible, there are all kinds of individuals that were actually sent by God to further the advancement of the purposes of God. Like, like for instance, Abraham was a type of an apostle. He was sent by God to pioneer a nation of people whom God would claim as his own. That's why you have to realize God called uh, Abraham out and then God tells him to go. Uh, go to a place I'll show you. It's a picture of him being sent. Uh, and so this man breaks a waiver uh, from his natural uh, line of people uh, and he pioneers and goes into uh, various territories and God builds a relationship with him uh, that forms into a covenant uh, and from his loins would, mer would emerge uh, God's firstborn after the flesh, Israel as a nation. Uh, and Abraham was sent to pioneer that. Uh, it's an apostolic type of work. Then you have Joseph. Uh, He's an apostolic model. And interesting how Joseph was sent in Genesis chapter 45. Joseph makes it clear to his people, listen, you, you, you didn't do nothing to me, but God sent me to preserve you and to keep you alive by great deliverance. Why? Because even though Joseph was sold into slavery, I mean, his siblings did a number on him. There was a call on his life. And he was, a, he was one commissioned by God to be a conduit for the people of God to be preserved and to be delivered. You see, it doesn't make a difference what hell has done to you through kinfolk through relatives, through people who claim that they had your back and they conspired against you when you were sent by God and there's an apostolic grace upon your life and there's power that God puts inside of you to pioneer a campaign to break the people through all of hell will come against you. There's a legitimate warfare assigned to apostolic believers in Joseph had to endure these scathing indictments uh, that could have put a death sentence on him. Uh, he had to endure being put in prison with no outdate, but because uh, there was a word that God had spoken over him. Uh, he was tried until his word came to pass. Uh, they put him in shackles and in bondage, uh, but yet he was sent by God. And he tells them uh, that you didn't do anything to me, but God sent me uh, to preserve you and to keep you alive. And I'm telling you, God wants to raise you up to be uh, uh, that type of believer that regardless of what you've gone through, you don't take it personal. You keep on pioneering man of God, woman of God, uh, until you break through uh, and you develop 
power and capacity from within to represent the one who sends you. Moses uh, was also an apostolic type. He was sent by God to liberate Israel uh, out of Egyptian captivity. Uh, he was a conduit for the judgments of God to fall uh, in Egypt also for miracles and signs and wonders. Uh, and I mean God did some powerful things. He sent Moses uh, under Pharaoh. Moses goes uh, and through the rod of Moses all kinds of judgment come uh, over the entire economy, political landscape uh, and households of Egypt of the Egyptians until liberation began to manifest. Some of you uh, you've been in a school of hard knocks uh, and indifference and you wondering why does it have to be so difficult for you? Why is it so tough for you? Uh, it's because the mission uh, on your life sanctioned by heaven brother is one of power and you're not just going to tip through the tulips and become some great liberator of your generation uh, without being tested, uh, without being tried by fire, without being able to live through accusations because when you're sent by God, uh, you're going to attract warfare. It's all kind of hell that'll break loose against you. Uh, but the one who sent you knows all things uh, and the one who sent you is the God who declared uh, in the person of Jesus Christ all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Uh, and you need to know that a part uh, of our suffering also legitimizes uh, uh, the one who sent us. Uh, your credibility sometimes as an heir of the kingdom of God uh, and once sent by God is connected to your endurance. Folk don't want to go through nothing. All these paper mache Christians uh, and all these saints, uh, the moment you, 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 you sneeze and look, look in the wrong direction, don't speak to them, don't greet them right, their feelings hurt, uh, they done backslid, uh, ready to withdraw their membership. Uh, and God ain't trying to raise up members. God trying to activate folk uh, for apostolic service uh, and send them to advance the kingdom of God. We need a, a strong membership base. That's where the discipleship piece comes in. That's where the delivering dimension. That's where they're building and developing a people. And it doesn't make a difference how dark your darkness is being. You get around a company of believers who understand what it means to be sent by God. Breakthrough is going to come upon your life and power encounters to develop you and take you into a realm of increase of substantial, substantiated growth like you have never known before. I prophesy times of encounter over you you will be a type of Moses for your family you'll be a type of Moses for your generation God will activate you to be a type of Joseph it will come such a level of wisdom and insight and intel for the future and you can develop things in the realm of time now to sustain the people in the days to come Nehemiah is another type of an apostolic builder Nehemiah was 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 serving a king named Xerxes and he was a cupbearer for the king it was illegal to come before the king with a sad face but in Nehemiah chapter 1 Nehemiah gets a report of the condition of the people of God and all of a sudden a burden came on him. He began to fast. He began to pray. He began to repent of their sins and he comes before the king in Nehemiah 2 and the king says you know this is nothing but a this countenance of yours. Uh, it's an issue of sadness of heart. Uh, he could have executed him then, uh, but Nehemiah begins to explain, no, this ain't got nothing to do uh, with, 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 with sadness. This has to do with a burden uh, that God has given me to do something for my people. Uh, and the king gives him favor. And the king gives him letters. Uh, and the king gives him leave to go. And Nehemiah is sent. Uh, and he goes and gets that wall built uh, in 52 days amidst uh, the sand battles, the Tobias uh, and the false prophets and the Geshe of his day. He persevered and built uh, through adversity. Uh, he mobilized people to construct that wall. Uh, and interestingly, uh, those who were building had a tool in one hand uh, and a weapon in the other. You get around legitimate apostles and apostolic believers, uh, you're going to have ability to build your future, to build your family, to build your marriage, uh, to build your career. But also there's a weapon in your hand. Uh, you know how to fight the enemies uh, of darkness, the enemies of God. Uh, you know how to keep God's inheritance clean. Uh, and that is what the church needs in this hour. Believers uh, who have been sent by the wisdom of God to understand uh, the capacity that heaven has put in us to build uh, a place for the individuals to be developed uh, for the glory of God to increase uh, for Christ's likeness to prevail but also uh, how to bind devils uh, how to rebuke wicked spirits uh, how to get the saints delivered uh, how to deal with warfare not buckle up and break down uh, and then teach some watered down version uh, of the gospel described by men uh, who don't want to deal with anything difficult in life uh, you got to realize folk are agonizing now in this world uh, and on this planet uh, because uh, of the indifferences of individuals and those who are fueled by the powers of darkness 
darkness uh, that are perpetuating suffering uh, and that are causing all kind of hardship and agony, uh, but yet God uh, wants to send you uh, as a representation uh, to liberate the bound and to set the captive free. Uh, Nehemiah was that type of builder, brother, and he got that wall built uh, and God's inheritance was preserved. Uh, I'm telling you, Christ is raising up believers uh, from every facet of life uh, to represent their generation well. Uh, and interestingly, uh, the term sent uh, is mentioned over 70 plus times uh, in the New Testament alone. I'm going to give you just a few more verses on this uh, 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 emphasis here. John chapter 6 verse 40, uh, and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, uh, and I'll raise him up at the last day. A part uh, of you and I being sent, the will of him who sends us uh, is that everyone uh, uh, that, that, see, that do Jesus, they can see us uh, and they can begin to believe. This is why when you're sent to to represent the one who sends you. Uh, Jesus is a sender and a part of our job uh, is to get folk to believe uh, that through the way we live, how we conduct our affairs, uh, through the lifestyle orientations uh, that we ascribe to, to our value system, uh, through us living what we preach and practicing what we teach. Uh, and that is what convinces the hearts of men to believe uh, that they can have everlasting life. Uh, here's an interesting one in, in verse number 44. No man can come to me except the Father which sent me draw him uh, and I'll raise them up at the last day. Uh, there's a draw that God puts uh, on believers. He sins. Uh and made people uh, who are subjected to pits, uh, people who are in caves, uh, people who are in the places of hopelessness and despair. I prophesy a supernatural draw coming upon those uh, that you have sent. Remember, a part of being apostolic uh, is the fact that you are sent on a mission uh, to rescue, to heal, uh, and deliver, to redeem from destruction. Uh, I pray for that apostolic anointing uh, to hit you, uh, that you will not sit idle and watch uh, humanity go to hell in a hand basket, uh, but you'll be that bold apostolic believer who will say Lord send me here I am I'll go and as the father sends you a multitude shall be snatched as a brand from the burning may power and presence come upon you may fresh oil and new wine hit your life and may that apostolic draw be upon you for the Lord declared if he be lifted up from the earth he would draw all men under him and when legitimate apostolic gifts are deployed by God the father one of our passions and ultimate burdens is to exist exalt the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot be deemed a legitimate apostolic gift or believer and you never exalt Christ because that's a part of the mission, brother, to make sure that you are activating the will of the one who sends you. He wants to draw. His will is that none perish but that all come and have everlasting life. And here's another I'm going to give you in John chapter 7 and verse number 16. Jesus answered them and said, uh, my doctrine is not mine, uh, but he is that sent me. Uh, isn't it amazing how folks just can preach whatever they want to preach, uh, whatever feel good to them, uh, and then the one they claim to be preaching on behalf of is never mentioned. Uh, how in the world can we be a preacher of Jesus uh, and a preacher of the gospel, uh, and then you got folk in the world, uh, or you got rejected, bound up, demonized Christians uh, who want to release blanket statements uh, and blame everybody who was involved in the body of Christ uh, for the indiscretions of one or two or three or four. We got to get this stuff right. Those who are sent by God realize that their doctrine is not theirs, but their doctrine is the one that sent them. That's like Jesus made it clear. My words are not mine, but I only speak as I hear and I speak as the Father has ordained. Apostolic gifts, apostolic ministry gifts. I don't care if your dominant grace is pastoral, you're still sent by God. And your responsibility is to promote his doctrine uh, and to make uh, his will known in the earth realm uh, my doctrine is not mine but his that sent me now I'm going to give you uh, one more point of emphasis and we're going to bring this session to a close I want to highlight Jesus as being a team builder I want to highlight Jesus as being a team but I emphasize in a session but we're going to pick that up uh, in another uh, scheduled session for you Christ as a team player in Luke chapter 8, verse number 1, it says, And it came to pass that he went throughout every city and village uh, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. You see, Jesus, as one sent by God, also had a responsibility to develop a team. And in developing a team, he was going to take everything that the Father had put in him as a representative of him 
and invested in his team. And that's why when you get around apostolic churches and apostolic believers, uh, there's an emphasis on training, training you to flow in the Spirit, training you to flow in the gifts of the Holy Ghost, training you uh, to develop Christ-likeness uh, and, and over and over and over because the goal is uh, to raise you as, up uh, as one that God will eventually uh, perfect the saints through. Uh, and so Jesus understood the importance uh, of having a strong team. Uh, and that's why everywhere he went and everything he did, he had his team with him uh, because the day was going to come uh, where well, he was going to send them uh, uh, into cities two by two into every territory uh, that he himself would come. Uh, and so you see this uh, in Matthew chapter 10. Uh, he sends them out to preach the kingdom uh, to cast out devils uh, and to heal the sick. Uh, also in Luke chapter 9 uh, he sends them out to preach the kingdom uh, and to heal the sick. Uh, in Mark chapter 6 he ordains 12 uh, and he sends them out uh, that they should preach the kingdom uh, and they should heal the sick everywhere. Uh, and then in Luke chapter 10 you find out where he sends out 70 uh, in teams of two uh, into every city where he himself would come. Uh, you get around apostolic ministries, uh, you'll find the uh, people doing things in teams. Uh, it's not about the senior pastor who is a great man, a woman of faith and power sent by God for that hour. They do all the praying. They do all the ministry. Uh, they do all the preaching. Uh, they do all the teaching. Nobody else can do anything. Uh, it's just them. It's a one-man wrecking crew, uh, and everything is about them. No, all eyes ain't on you, man. Uh, you ain't your, all. I, it ain't about you. It's about Jesus. Uh, and when you, when when people have diversified portfolios of ministry, uh, where there's a working team concept, uh, you can see that synergy. Uh, and something about our humanity that fights uh, a team concept. Uh, but most organizations and ministries uh, that develop a powerful team. concept concept they break through uh, they strive uh, it ain't nothing like having somebody uh, that you know uh, that has your back your best interests uh, who can work with you and who's not afraid uh, of who you are and what you carry uh, and folk uh, that have power and get intimidated by other people uh, is because they don't understand uh, that they've been sent by God uh, and they ain't on a mission to represent the one that sends them uh, you're trying to keep your little sacred cows intact uh, and maintain your little area and you're territorial and controlling uh, but that is a that is a satanic attribute that works against team. Team ministry is essential to the advancement of any ministry endeavor and the overall establishment of an apostolic culture. All throughout the scriptures you will see, uh, even in the development of the early church, there were teams that were sent. Uh, Paul and Silas, Paul and Barnabas, uh, and there, there are other ministry gift prophets that were sent out uh, uh, to do specific works. Christ demonstrated team ministry by allowing those joined to him to have intimate access to his sphere of ministry. The continuity of any commission that is ordained by God is going to require team ministry. It's interesting how so many people fight this and lack the ability to work with one another and also the extending of the kingdom of God and his succession plan for his citizens requires team ministry. Uh, Jesus built the team. We need to build teams. Uh, we need teams that have a vested interest uh, in the overall synergy and welfare of our local churches uh, in order to advance the purposes of God. Uh, may the Father breathe upon you afresh uh, and may strong, vibrant, uh, apostolic teams be raised raised up uh, within your local assemblies uh, to advance the vested interests of the one who sends us uh, as representatives of his. Praise ye the Lord. And God bless you, people of God. Thank you uh, for allowing us this time once again. Uh, uh, just a quick recap. We've dealt with uh, the, the aspect of Christ being a sender, and we've given you various types of those that he sends, Christ being a messenger of the kingdom, and Christ being a team builder, but we're considering him as the apostle and high priest of our profession from Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. We're drawn to him, that is the conclusion, and then we purpose to develop what we see in him as one sent as an exact representation of God the Father. May the Lord begin to give you grace, may he be glorified through you, May, be, may, may he be exalted through you. May the power of God be upon you. May the Lord continue to give you wisdom and insight to become a people that have been deployed by him as a representative of him to advance the kingdom of God. I bless, speak grace and impartation over you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Don't forget, people, we're still pushing 
Our We Build 2.0 campaign, we need partnership, we need prayer. We're approaching the finish line, and your support is needed. Uh, uh, follow all the information on how you can become a partner with us, and then just a part of the overall partnership and collaborative effort to help River Chicago make history and advance the kingdom of God. More grace. Until next time, God bless, and make sure that you do all you can to honor the one who sends you. Well, it's giving time. Go ahead and begin to type in the comments. I'm a cheerful giver. Come on, type that in the comments. I'm a cheerful giver. I'm a cheerful giver. Listen, Rivers family, our partners, friends, and all you that give, allow me to take a moment and let you know what giving does. Through giving, we reach our community. Through giving, we spread the gospel. Through giving, we fight the darkness. Through giving, we feed the hungry. Through giving, we worship the God of our salvation. Through giving, we heal the broken. Through giving, we fulfill our mission to exalt Jesus Christ, educate the believer, and engage the culture. Your giving matters. Through giving, we create environments, whether it's face-to-face -face or virtually, for people to know Jesus Christ and to advance the kingdom. Today, 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 I want to pray over your giving and weaponize it to accomplish God's purposes in the earth. Father, right now, I bring these cheerful givers before you. And according to Proverbs 3, 9 through 10, which declares honor the Lord with your capital and sufficiency from righteous labors and with the first fruits of all your income. So shall your storage places be filled with plenty and your vats shall be overflowing with new wine. I call for abundance as we honor the Lord with our capital and with our sufficiency. Our storage places, our investments, our bank accounts are filled with plenty and our presses are bursting forth with new wine. We are abundantly supplied. Oh, Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, in accordance to Philippians 419, you said in your word that you are the God who will take care of us. You are the God who will supply all our needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So in the mighty name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and on the authority of his holy word, we call all debts to be paid in full. We speak to debts in the mighty name of Jesus. We command you to be paid. We command you to be gone, dematerialize, and cease to exist. We declare that all debts, all medical bills, all notes, and any debts past, present, or future are paid in full. They are canceled. They are dissolved in the name of Jesus. Father, we immediately respond in faith to the guidance of the Holy Spirit within us. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are always having us in the right place at the right time because our footsteps are ordered by the Lord. Our God makes all grace abound towards us in every favor and every earthly blessing that we always having all sufficiency for all things may abound unto every good work. The Lord has opened unto us his good treasure and has blessed the work of our hands. He has commanded the blessing upon us in our storehouse and all that we undertake and we receive the blessing of the Lord that makes rich and adds no sorrow with it in Jesus mighty name. Hallelujah. Now all my cheerful givers, all my cheerful givers from rivers of living water, all the cheerful givers of our partners and all those that are friends and all those that sow into the ministry. I just thank you for being there for us and doing what you do to the glory of God to promote his plans and his purposes in the earth realm. Right now, I just want to take time out and I want to thank you for being a part of our online worship experience. We look forward to ministering to you again. Again, real soon. God bless.